have to go on like CTV and it's like, I don't know what that kid's problem was. He's <laughs> Tobin. He's Tobin with a T. This guy's like treating me like his his best friend. I am the prime yeah. minister of yeah. Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he just walked, Trudeau, what up, yeah, yeah, Trudeau? Well, yeah, what's up, Trudes? It's like, <laughs> it's like, I really like that law you passed earlier. Killer. <laughs> And then he just be like, get him out of here. I don't care what <laughs> podcast he's with. I don't care how popular he is. Yeah. I'd be yeah. like, all right, that's fair. We just finished watching the Leafs game, Toronto versus Calgary. Uh, people are going to be like, why are they talking about that game? It was long done. Listen. As you should know by now, these interviews are pre-recorded. If not, I'm sorry to spoil it for you. But I was just telling Greg, you know, they scored. Matthew scores in overtime. They should be playing the song, Raising Some Hell Under (laughs) Northern Lights. And people are like, why does that sound familiar? Oh, because this is the guy that, you know, does the song. Hell yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Northern Lights, baby. Absolutely. It's a a fun song. It's a fun song. I do like that. So to be completely honest with you, and this is why I kind of uh, enjoy these aspects of this podcast, because originally when I came up with this podcast, it was my idea of um, interviewing bigger, like big artists. Like I was like, yeah, let's get Adam Sandler on. And then it's like, dude, what are you going to send him to even get him to come on? And I was like, you're right. So over years, you kind of grow and you're like, you know what? I'm a Canadian. Let's help other Canadians out. And interestingly enough, uh, it was interviewing a few people that I didn't know at first and yeah. grew to like, like Robin Adelini, yeah. um, and like loved her song F-150. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow, this is Canadian. But one day, and I think she does it pretty often sometimes, is she shares other artists that she likes. Yeah. And I think in her story, she was like, love this song. And it was by you. And it was Northern Lights. And I was like, yeah, I like this song. Let's reach out to him. And then I think my interpretation is, any PR person would tell you like, Hey, be nice. Send him a nice message. I was like, screw that. A lot of people do that. So I think I just sent you a voice memo. I was like, Hey Greg, this is Tobin (laughs) from Newfoundland. You want to do an interview? And I was like, he's probably going to ignore that. Think I'm crazy. And then you sent a voice message back and I'm like, all right. Yeah. We're in business here. (laughs) You, you, you send voice. I'm coming back with voice. You know, you have to, you have to follow suit. (laughs) Um, but I want to ask you like, cause we're going to go all over the place in this interview. Uh, but I want to ask you like, what kind of drew you to that song or to create that song? Like, did you just look up one night at the sky and was like, you know what? I don't think anyone's done a song about this. <laughs> it's so funny, man. It's it, it, that song was never actually written about Northern lights. And, and that's what a lot of people like it, it obviously it took shape to that. Um, but I was actually wrote, I wrote the song with Parker gray and I remember I was just like, we were in the midst of COVID. Um, I was stuck in the house. I was just like, I didn't, couldn't go anywhere. Like everything was closed. And I remember I, I jumped on the right with Parker. It was our first time ever writing together. And I was kind of like a little bit like nervous, like anxious. And I was just like, uh, I don't know. I had a good feeling that she was just going to be this, like, like I had a lot of rights in the past, like that month. I, Cause that month I wrote every single day. Um, and I just wanted to write every single day with people. So I had a couple of rights in the, in the middle, in the beginning of the week that like, you know, they were, they were good rights, but they just didn't blow me away. So like, yeah. I'm kind of going into this, right. Kind of a little bit, kind of on my back, on my heels, just being like, okay, it's a Friday night. Like, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. Right. And like, I'm craving a beer. So I remember I'm just like, I jump on and I'm just like, what's going on Parker? And just like, we just, we started, you know, talking and stuff. And she's like, yeah, how are you doing? I'm like, to be honest, I'm having a beer right now. And she's like, you're having a beer. And I'm like, yeah. She's like, I'm going to grab a beer. And I'm like, go grab a beer. And we just started like talking and hanging out. And and I was just saying to her, I was like, man, what would you want to do right now? If we could, if we could just like erase COVID and not be in this right now, like, what would you like to do? And uh, she was like, oh, I just, I don't know, I'd like to be with my friends. And I'm like, oh, let me just tell you what I want to do. I'd love to be in a friggin' forest right now with a big bonfire and a huge cooler of beer and just like country music playing and just sitting around and just partying and like having a good time. And the Northern Lights was just kind of the stars. It was the stars and it wasn't the lights at that point. It was just like partying under the Northern Stars. And uh, cause that's what, that's what I grew up doing. And she was like, okay, I really like that idea. And then we just started kind of crafting it. And uh, we wrote that that night. And uh, 
Yeah, I loved it. And I was just like, it was, I felt it was just a, a song for, you know, just like everyone that just to have a good time to raise a, raise a glass to. And we all needed that song because I feel that song just allowed people just to be like, as much as we're going through crap right now, like one day we're going to be sitting around a fire again and we're just going to raise some hell under Northern Lights. Absolutely. I like that you said it was like a, a Zoom meeting or a Zoom, like a Zoom session yeah. kind of thing. Because I'm imagining if it's like the later stages of Zoom when people kind of understood it, great. But if it's the beginning stage, it's like, I no, I, I, I said, no, are you, are you there? Like, Parker. And then it's like, I can't hear you. And then you're just like, is she still chugging that beer? It's like, <laughs> yeah. no, it's frozen. But no, yeah, we've had Parker on. Parker's great. Yeah, I, I actually, so my idea of when I heard Northern Lights, I, again, similar to what you said, is just having a good time with your friends. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we don't really have what you call a summer. It's almost like, hey, this is the best weather you're going to get, even though it's still cold. Yeah. So I'm out shooting a basketball. And then when like I heard the song on Route Out Lady's uh, story and then I downloaded it, I was like, you know what? Like, this isn't a bad song to just shoot some hoops out in the evening. And like, you know, just like if you make a three pointer out of 20, you're just like, <laughs> hell yeah, I'm <laughs> Steph Curry now. But yeah, yeah I, I've I've got like neighbors that have little kids that kind of enjoy it. And it's nice because I'm not labeling it, but there are some times that you'll turn on Eminem and then it's like someone's parent be like, don't go over near him because that's not <laughs> what we want to listen to. But when you put on country, I feel like for the most part, it's a safe space, depending on the artist. Sometimes you're kind of like, all right, but um, yeah. yeah, doing a little bit of a bio of you. Uh, I, I like, though, that you, your approach was. Um, you like doing country music, but you're not about just like writing songs about trucks, beers, girls. And uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, you know what? When you come to think about it, it is generally that. But you mm -hmm. do have artists out there that try to differ away from it. But then there's always at least one song in the repertoire that's yeah. one of the three. And I'm that not was, saying that I'm yeah. knocking it because I, 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 if someone came to my house tomorrow and be like, all right, you are knocking it. Let's see your iPhone. I'd be like, no, no, please don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Northern Lights is definitely the most country song that I've put out to date. And, you know, it was, it was just kind of like, I definitely knew I was, I was stepping into some stereotypes and I was just like, you know what though? Like it's a, it's just a Canadian fun song. And, you know, I just, we just need it. We just need it right now at that time. So I just, I just went with it and put it out. Absolutely. I, I want to ask you too, because I, I think we do have a little bit of relationship here in terms of not in the sense of the singing or the country music side, because if you told me to go get a guitar tomorrow and put out a country song, I'm like, I can write one for you. Mm -hmm. But to perform it? No, you'd be like, Parker, come back to the session and don't invite Tobin because Tobin sucks. <laughs> but you I, I heard that you originally wanted to get into like sports broadcasting at one point, like you were sitting down at uh, school and high school. And you were meeting with a media account or a counselor. I was going to say yeah. media counselor, but they were, they asked you like, what did you want to do? And you said you like talking sports. Mm -hmm. And I believe volleyball was your sport that you went to university for. And you were like, good, this goes best of both worlds. Yeah. But tell me a little bit about that because I read a few articles that mentioned that. And yeah. then I was just like, he's like, yeah, it's like sports wasn't for me. I was just like, man, as someone that has a sports journalism background, I was like, huh, I'm a little bit offended. Not too yeah. offended though, but I get it. But yeah. just tell me, like, explain that a little bit to me. Like, what drew you to the sports broadcast, and then kind of drifted you towards the music side? Yeah. So, um, you know, growing up, I was always a huge sports highlights guy. Like, I would every morning I had the same morning routine. I'd get up and I'd just get my whatever breakfast I was eating that day. And I'd sit in front of Sportsnet, or I'd switch. Sometimes it was like, you know, it kind of. They, different ones took the the top spot you know like one time i was i was a big score fan and then jay and dan came in and i was like you can't not watch tsn and uh you know i would always get up and i just love to watch the highlights and and you know i i was just so attracted to just like kind of the highlights and just being able to sit up there and talk about sports and uh you know, I, in, in senior year, I just, music wasn't even in the picture yet. Like I didn't even play guitar. I, I, I sang, I sang a lot, but it was more of like singing in the car or goofing off or just singing down the hallway. And like, some people were like, yo, your voice isn't that bad. I'm just like, thanks. And I'm like, I don't <laughs> sing, you know, I just, I just sing, I just do it. And, uh, 
never would I have thought that like I'd ever get into music. And I remember I was talking to guidance counselor and I was just, I walked in, I was like, listen, like I have no idea what to do next year. Like I'm so lost. And she's like, well, like, what are your interests? And like, I told her about that, the sports highlights. And she's like, well, like, you know, have you looked into sports broadcasting? I'm just like, Hmm, that seems pretty cool. Actually. I like to be on camera. I like to like do all that kind of stuff. I get to talk about things I love and sports. And I was like, you know what? That's actually a really good idea. And then I remember um, I got actually scouted to to play to play volleyball at uh, like like college level, and um, it was at Niagara College. And I remember looking at their programs, and one of the programs was TV broadcasting. I was like, okay, this is kind of meant to be, right? I, I get to get um, you know some money off school, and I I get to go to a program that like has shown some interest, like I've shown some interest in. So. I went through it and I, and I started going through the program, playing volleyball. Volleyball was definitely my focus. I kind of like was so just kind of, it, it was fun being a varsity athlete and just kind of being able to just kind of not, not just be a student. Like I was just, wasn't just going to class all the time. I think the, the best part of being a varsity athlete was I was getting interviewed by my peers, which I thought was hilarious because we had a really good volleyball team and every game was, um, was broadcasted so my whole class would be gathered around the big gym and they'd have all the cameras down on us and i was the captain of the of the team so after the game if we won or something they'd be like greg can we get an interview with you i'm like yeah of course i'm like what's what's up what's up chad how are you and he's yeah. like he's like i'm like yeah good man like let's want to go to over here and talk i'm like yeah let's yeah. talk and then they'd be shooting questions i'm like hey we learned that today we learned how yeah, to yeah. Do an interview <laughs> like that today like good for you yeah. And I, I thought that was so funny. And then um, just going through it, I just, after about year two, I, I just started kind of thinking to myself, um, I remember the teacher would always say to me in, in class, he'd go, you know, you better get ready. He's like, if, he's like sports broadcasting is, is something you have to dedicate your life to. Like, if this is, if you have a little inkling of, of not sure that this is for you and you keep looking at that door, he's like, go take that door. Because if you're not completely in for this, into the grind of moving to small towns and really going for it all, uh, this might not be for you. And that really played in the back of my head. And I just remember every single time he said that, I go, where's the door? <laughs> Maybe that door is for me. Like, it's interesting, but do I, is this my my true calling? Is this my life calling or do I have to search some more? And, um, you know, I still stuck through it. I graduated. Uh, everyone got internships in radio and TV, and I got, I picked up a bartending job in Muskoka. And I was like, "You guys are all doing your careers. I'm going to go be a 21 year old and have an amazing summer, and still one of the best summers of my life." And I remember coming home from that summer, and if I didn't have an internship by the start of September, I actually had to do a 10,000 word essay at, in college, and I was like, "Hell no, I'm not, I'm not doing that." So I was literally bartending and I had two weeks left until I had to go back to school. And this, this random dude came into the bar with his wife and they were sitting at the bar and we became best friends and shooting it and just talking all weekend. And I'm like, can I ask what you do? And like, what do you do for a living? He's like, oh, I'm actually a TV producer in Toronto. And I was like, no shit. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, well, listen, I'm just going to be blunt with you. Uh, I, I need an internship. It's, it's unpaid. I'm literally going to be like a free worker for you. What's the chance you give me a job? They said, wow. Okay. I did not expect this, but like, let's, let's chat about this some more. I, I could probably use some help. And I'm like, perfect. Let's, I'd love to help you. Yeah. And he gave me an internship and I worked in Toronto for a couple months and, uh, and I was working, working it and having some fun and learning about sales and learning about media production and learning about kind of the back end of not even sports broadcasting and then I got in a car accident on the way home from this internship. And that was my turning point in life. That's when I really sat down with myself and I said, I asked myself one question. I said, if I died, how would I, how would I be remembered? And something was calling to me that I wanted to make a bigger mark. I wanted to do something that just wasn't done. Wasn't like not done, but just something that I was just something, something that a was, huge something risk. A little bit, yeah. Like something different out of, out of yeah. the box, out of the box and un or and like, you know, I just didn't think that my calling was in sports broadcasting. And, um, 
yeah, that's kind of where my life started to, to, to go in a different path. And I started finding music and, um, you know, I remember I had to move six hours away from my hometown to get the confidence to sing in front of a live crowd for the first time. And ever since that day, I remember getting up there, forgetting every single lyric, but a small applause came from the audience. And I was like, I sucked and they still clapped. And I'm like, I'm like, imagine if I could get better at that. Imagine if I could work at that and actually get better and do this. What, what, what could happen? And that's how kind of music started coming to my life. I like when you mentioned about moving away like six hours just to gain confidence <laughs> because I love comedy and I'm from Newfoundland. So yeah. I feel like it's kind of like a tie in where it's like, hey, he's a Newfoundlander. He should be just born funny. And I'm like, that's great. But I don't think I do stand up in Newfoundland to begin with because even if you had friends that came out to watch, they're going to support you. But then there's people that you, if you bomb, that's yep. all they're going to really notice you for is like, Hey, yep. I know him. And he bombed regardless yep. if you get better. So I remember going to Carlton for communications yep. and it was maybe I was done Carlton. I was at Algonquin doing radio. And I was like, you know what? Like just to get better with just how I do delivery on radio. I was like, if I suck at this, which I still love comedy, still passion, but like, I was making the excuse of like, if people don't laugh at it, I can say, all right, well, we'll be the serious radio broadcaster. But yep. I remember going up and it was like an open mic. And my friends that are in comedy said, you should go to a yuck yucks or a just like a just for laughs or, or an absolute comedy. Mm-hmm. I went to a pancake house thinking like, what's the worst that could happen? Here's the yeah. worst. People come in, they want pancakes. They don't yeah. want to hear you, <laughs> but there were people there that will sit and listen. Yeah, And we didn't go over anything. So one person introduced me as like, this guy is like the son of Microsoft's own. And I was like, is that me? Like I'm second in line, but like no one. So someone was like, get your ass up there. And I was like, all right. So did a few jokes kind of bombed because I was frustrated of how to deliver. Still yeah. got laughs. And yeah. I was like, all right, this isn't the worst thing. And then I thought to myself on the bus ride home, like, who's going to give a shit? Like literally, if you didn't do well, no one knows. But yep. I got myself so psyched out that I'm like, I'm on a bus. There are people at yep. that were at that show that are on the bus that are probably going to be like, that's that guy. <laughs> yeah. And I'd be, I'd be like, I can't go anywhere in this town. So yeah. I just started to go like, I'll just be the comedy broadcast guy that like the people will say, you're so good. You should do stand up. I'd be like, yeah, I should, but just never yeah. do it. And then they'd be like, who knows what his potential could be? And then it's like, all right, well, do you like the podcast? Yeah, it's so great. I'm like, well, there's my potential. That's yep. what I was designed to do. <laughs> Man, I love it. Stand up is something I respect the hell out of stand up comedians. Like yeah. I I went through a course for stand up and I I remember going through it and I was like, "Man, like one thing I love to do is I love to do like improv music. I love to do like improv like like just I, I come up with a random progression and sing about what I see." And I remember like that's what I kind of put into my shows. But I remember going to the stand up course and I was so nervous and I'm like, "I don't know why. It's just like being funny and like, and tr- you know, really trying to be funny is to like, try to a, be funny. Yeah. Try to be funny. It's like, and I remember the one guy says to me, he goes, man, you're so comfortable on stage. Like I can definitely tell you're a performer, but he's just like, I'm going to be honest with you. He's like, one thing that's like, you need to work on is like your punchlines. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not really a punchline guy. Like I don't, I don't have a passion for sitting there and writing a hundred punchlines and then reworking and reworking and reworking like a true stand-up comedian does. And yeah. I realized in that moment, I'm like, you know, I'm not a stand-up comedian. I'm, I'm a performer that can maybe just like awkwardly make a joke during his show and make yeah. people make people giggle. But as long as I'm just not forced to write jokes, like that's not where I see myself. It's, it's funny because I like that crossover. Like, you know, when you go to mm. see certain acts, you know what you see. Oh, look, oh, Le- 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 Leafs. Oh, I've got something for the end of this that you'll, you'll enjoy. But uh, I like when you go to see certain acts because like, you kind of, through their own persona, you know what to expect. Like, and again, no shade thrown at these people. They could surprise you. But like, to me, if I'm going to a John Mayer concert, I don't expect John Mayer to get up and tell me jokes. I expect yeah. him to go up and like rock a guitar and you leave yeah. going like, man, that guy can really play. Yeah. Uh, I've gone to see Vince Gill when he came down here. And I was like, I only knew one song, but I was like, I'll go see him. And at, at first, to be honest with Vince Gill, I was like, oh, man, these songs I don't know. This is boring. But he gained a lot of my respect because 
before he even became or like did a first uh, song, he came on the mic and said, the last time we were in Newfoundland, it was like 1980. He's like, we just landed from that because the fog is so bad. And I was like, that's a good joke. I'm like, yeah. I don't even care if that's like the only joke he ever says. Mm -hmm. But like the crowd loved it. I'm like, this is a guy who can make fun of himself, but also just have a good time. And I'm like, great. And the same with like a Reba or Garth Brooks. I feel like they're yeah. like the same. And it's not that you're going to them to for comedy, but if they give you a joke or something, it's almost like a bonus. So you're yeah. like, great. So, I mean, if that's what you get out of it in your shows where it's like, Hey, I went to see Greg Ryder, love the show, but God, he gave me some like really good jokes among like, it started to rain and he was like, this isn't the Northern lights that I was like planning. And I'm like, that's yeah. good. He understands that this is kind of humorous. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's well, some and that's, people would yeah. freeze. <laughs> exactly. And that's like one thing that I never wanted to do music for is I never wanted to stand up on stage and just go song to song to song to song. Because I, I love banter. Like that's like, that's I, my favorite thing to do is like, I love to walk into a room and not know anybody and just have a bar full of people. And my challenge by the end of that night is to get people just kind of interacting with each other interacting with me and just kind of just giving them just this outlet to like don't sit there and just be like he's not bad he's good he's good yeah, yeah. i want them i want i'm like what's going on how you doing over there you doing good where are you from and he's just like oh yeah. from from calgary and i'm like sick he's just like and we talk and i'm talking to everyone i'm just like and i'm talking and then that's just kind of like everyone comes up to me they're like man like that was just so fun. Like you just started singing the song about my, about my, my dad and like how, like, yeah. you know, it's just, I just try and make it interactive and, and that's the kind of show, no show will ever be the same. And that's what I really try and do. Well, that's, that's the beauty of it too, right? Like if you have that kind of, um, I guess personality or a specialty in a sense, cause I know, uh, going to like parties in university, not that I was in, invited to a lot, but there would be people that, when you first go in the room, you're kind of clinging to your friend because you're like, I don't know a lot of people here. Yeah. And then that friend kind of says, oh, I won't leave you. I'll stay by your side. And then some other guy comes in. He's like, Dave. And then you're like, fuck, Dave. <laughs> you just left me here. So then people would panic. And then at the end of the night, be like, I hate you. You left me. And, I, and that's my point of going like, he's no longer here. Yeah. So let's go into this big room where there's a lot of people and just, you know, talk and see yeah. what happens and i think as i got older and more comfortable with it people would go to the main room and i would kind of hang out in the kitchen and then yeah. people would come to you like mysteriously of like why is there just this random guy in the kitchen and they <laughs> expect you to be like shy and i'm just like yeah man like you guys have fun like i'm okay here in the kitchen just like talking to whoever comes in it's almost like <laughs> i'm bored of the whole entertainment out there let's go find the entertainment in the kitchen and yeah, you yeah. just talk to and then that would start to become a little bit of an area and then you'd get people from the other room like, why are they all in the kitchen? It's like, well, this guy <laughs> just talks to us and he's nice. And I'm that, just like, sorry. Dude, you got to put that into your, into a comedy bit. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, it's almost like it's almost like you create your office. You create your office at yeah. a party and it's just like, I'm going to post up here. It's like, yeah. you, you can go into someone else's like atmosphere environment. It's like, nah man i'm gonna let yeah. them come to me yeah it's just like i'm a dude in the kitchen I'm the and dude i'm not in the like, kitchen. I'm offended if like by the end of the night there's like two people there i'm just they're like hey like you guys had a good time i went into that space too when i wanted to but i came back to my office to do my own work uh i did want to ask you to kind of because when you mentioned about the car accident um like you went and said that that kind of changed your whole perspective on life or like what you wanted to do but like Tell me the whole process into leading up to that. Cause I know like a lot of people won't have maybe that dramatic of a moment, but there have been moments in people's history that they're like, this is where I turned the dial. This is where I was like, I need to get serious because I, I think there's a phrase and I, I'm probably going to butcher it, but you had said in an interview prior that nearly every teacher you had or every person that was like helping you along an education said, if you just applied yourself, you could be successful. Was that something like, I know when you're like in the motions, is that something that went through your head? Like, Oh my God, if I just applied myself, I could be successful. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, it's, I was the, I was always the kid with the potential and it was just like, I always remember that. It was just like, Greg, I, I still remember like my favorite story was in, was in this grade 11 class and we're sitting there and, and, and the teacher had about five minutes left in the class and she goes, um, you know, we got five minutes. Let's just, let's just ask some questions and just kind of let the bell ring. And she goes, eh, 
what are you guys doing next year? What are you, what are you, you're thinking about planning for uh, post-secondary? And everyone puts up their hand like, me, 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 me. And they're like, okay, well, you. And, and they talk about their, their whole plan, their whole life plan. They're like, I'm going to do this, then this, and then this, and then this. And I'm like, I'm sitting in the back. I'm like, oh, like I'm usually like first up, like class clown, like give yeah. me that answer. And I'm like in the back, like, I'm good. No, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. I'm ring good. the bell. And, ring the bell. And, and, she, and she literally sees my hand is the only one not up. And she goes, Greg, how about you? Yeah. I go, oh, what's up? Yeah, yeah. My hand uh, wasn't up. My hand wasn't up. Why are you I'm asking good. me? I'm just let everyone else go. She's like, no, I want to hear this. And I'm like, Honestly, Miss D, um, everyone called, it was Miss Daloisio, but I always called her Miss D. I was like, Miss D, I was like, honestly, I have no idea what I want to do in my life. And she's like, okay, it's fair. I'm like, I just know one day I, I'm just going to entertain people. I don't know what I'm doing. I think it's going to make me some money. And I'm just going to, just going to entertain people. And she's like, how? I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm doing yet or who I'm entertaining, but I just know that I, I just love it. I just love being in front of people. And she's like, well, Greg, I'll be honest with you. If anyone else said that, I'd probably be like, uh. yeah. but Greg, when you finally find what you're eventually going to do with your life, you were going to do amazing at it. And I was like, whoa, I did not expect that to go there. And like, that was the first time that I remember that a teacher or like any kind of like, a parent and, a, and, a, and a, an adult said to me that, Hey, maybe you're not crazy for trying to want, want to do this and, and live a life outside of the norm and not just do what everyone else is doing and go to university and get a good job and stuff. And I was like, huh? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. I like that. I, I also imagine like now this is my kind of a, a little bit of a class clown myself, but I'm a closet class clown because there was guys yeah. that were obviously more popular that would get the joke and then you'd make it. And they're like, <laughs> like, oh, the nerd over there has jokes. It's like, yeah, we're, we don't laugh at him. Otherwise, you lose your popularity status. But like, I, I like how you're like Miss D because in my mind, I'm just like, it was the Fawn sitting next to you. It was like, Miss D. Like, what are you? He's like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know I'm going to do something. And then it's like, well, when you figure it out, let me know. It's like, thanks, Miss D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how my, when you say Miss D, I'm just like, yeah, it's like, I don't think I've ever called a teacher. Yeah. I, I know I call them like, because it's hockey and it's Canada. Yeah. I'm sure I've gone into teachers that were like, Mr. Bruce, yeah. Mr. Densmore. I'm like, Densmore, Bruce, what are we doing today? They're like, excuse me. I'm like, hey man, I'm just trying to communicate the Canadian hockey way. Yeah. It's like, I don't play oh, hockey, yeah. but I'm just trying my best here. Yeah. <laughs> and they'd it. be like, it's Mr. Bruce. I feel exactly. like even if I ever met uh, Justin Trudeau, I'd be like, what's up Trudes? Be like, it's Trudeau. And I'd be like, yeah, what are you saying? True. And then he'd be like, he'd be like True. just get out of it. He'd be like, get out of here. And I'd be like, all right, JT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just keep on doing it until he gets so infuriated that it's like you yeah. he'd have to go on like CTV. And it's like, I don't know what that kid's problem was. He's like, Tobin. He's Tobin with a T. This guy's like treating me like his, his best friend. I am the prime yeah. minister of yeah. Canada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he just walked, Trudeau, what up, yeah, bro? Yeah, well, yeah, what's up, Trudes? It's like, it's like, I really like that law you passed earlier. Kill her. And then you just be like, get him out of here. I don't care what podcast he's with. I don't care how popular he is. Yeah. I'd be yeah. like, all right, that's fair. Um, yeah. But I, I did want to mention, of course, about the, the class clown bit. Because I, I we've had a lot of people on that were like performers that do say that they were like either the class clown or they were just the funny one in school. Like uh, Colin Mockery from Whose Lines It Anyway had said that he was never really into comedy until his friend dared him to. He got his first laugh, loved it. I'm like, very similar story, I feel. But mm -hmm. like, tell me what drew you to be like the class clown. Was it just like to try to be entertaining? Was it just trying to get like people to notice you? Because in my sense, I never felt comfortable being the class clown, but more or less like you would see a popular person later in their own time. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, this project we got to do tonight sucks. I'd be like, yeah, that's stupid. And they'd be like, I'd be like, oh my God, you're actually pretty funny. And I'm just like, yeah, don't tell people like, don't. I, I do. I want to make unpopular forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, 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 for me, it was just like, you know, I was always a very rambunctious and, you know, I've had some developments actually happen in the past week where my whole life I was told that I have ADHD and I, and I, and I'm just this hyper, hyper kid. And, you know, I could never sit still in class and, you know, in middle school, I, I remember I had a meeting it was just me and every single teacher in the school that, that taught me and my parents. 
So this was a very special meeting. And it was like, uh, Mr. Mr. You know, my real last name is Farrell, Greg Ryder Farrell. And they're like, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Farrell, uh, we brought you in here because we need to talk about Greg. He is just absolutely hard to handle. Can't handle him. He's always run, getting up, walking around, walks up to the front, purposely sharpens his pencil, like, <laughs> and he's like, they're like, you need to get this kid checked. And, and my mom was like, my mom told me, always tells me the story. She's like, I just rose my voice. I was like, raised my voice. I was like, no, we're not getting him. He's just a, he's just a kid. He has yeah. a lot of energy. He likes to play sports. You know, like let him just let him go free and run and all this kind of stuff. So I never got tested for any of that stuff, but it was always just very fidgety and very like that was my stage. That was like my chance for me to get a couple laughs. And, you know, if there was a cute girl in the class, I was always just trying to like make her make 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 everyone laugh and chuckle. And like, you know, that was kind of my like my fun. It was just like I go into class and it's just like, OK, Greg, we're going to try and focus today. I'd be like. Yeah, we are. totally. Yeah, I'm, fo- I'm. I'm gonna focus on my delivery of this joke I have in yeah, my yeah, head, yeah. And, yeah. and I'm waiting for that perfect time when I go, ding. Yeah, but yet it wasn't. It wasn't ever like on purpose. It was just kind of something that like was my was my escape and my fidget and just kind of just like things the things that made me happy and the teachers. It was weird though because I I have this very this thing about me where like. I would still have a great friendship with the teachers. I disturb them all yeah. class, but then at the end, I'd be like, you know, I'm just messing just, around. Yeah, just and joking. they're like, they're like, Greg, I know, but like, just come on, just Dude, give, give me more. It's, it's like give if me this more. Was, if this was in the '60s, I'd be able to hit you with a ruler, but I yeah, can't. So just, this is the best way I can communicate with you. Yeah, <laughs> give me more. And then I would, I would always like hand in my work on time. I'd always do decent. I'd always do like I was a 75 average kid. I would always get my work done and my tests and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, they were just like, you're not doing, you're a B student that just, you know, is a little bit rambunctious and just likes, an to, ass. Just, like, <laughs> likes to goof off. Yeah. And I'm like, I, yep, that's me. <laughs> yeah. I feel like when you mentioned that story, like about just getting like the attention part of it, because I know for me, my kind of, like highlight and maybe like all the years I went to the school and it's kind of a comedy story, I guess, but like my biggest thing was I was really good at public speaking. Now, Same. like it was one of those things that they graded you on. So it was yeah. almost like my mom was always forcing you to get good grades. And like yeah. at the time when you're like 10 years old, you're like, screw it, like leave yeah. me alone. But I it, like, you know, this might be the first time you thank her. So hopefully she listens to it, but like, you know, I'm glad that she kind of pushed you because I don't think I'd be, as great a public speaker if not for that but i love the fact that i was always like a top say top three in public speaking from grade five yeah and it was like in high school that was the thing that all the popular kids then started to notice you for when public speaking came around because yeah. you're in different homerooms and it's like listen guys if we win we'll have a pizza party and then all <laughs> eyes turned on you where it's like we're counting on your goddamn ass yeah because we want yeah. goddamn pizza and yeah. i'd always get second and like the, the teacher was humble about it. they're like, you tried. That's good. And I'm like, I got second. That's not bad. But all the other kids are like, why do you keep getting second? What is wrong with you? Like, why can't you get first? I'm like, dude, I'm not losing to the same person every year. And they're like, does that help your case? I'm like, I guess not. But I remember one time getting up on stage and it was one of the points that I didn't win. But I was like, they asked me to come back to just be like the moderator or like the intro. Yeah. And four or five of them were sitting there. This is maybe like 12 great or like they're 12 years old. And they're like, I'm really nervous. I'm really nervous. Like I haven't been this far. And I was just like, I'm really nervous too, guys. And then one of the girls was like, shut the fuck up. David. <laughs> you always place well. I'm like, so I can't even fit in. I can't even fit in when I try where I'm like, Hey, I'm also nervous where you think they'd be like, Oh my God. One of the good speakers is nervous too. They're like, fuck off. Yeah. Like, suck it like you yeah you always yeah. win or come second i don't believe a, sh- a word of your mouth and i'm just like all right fair <laughs> like yeah. i don't know where i belong here but um yeah i like no. that because in, ter- in terms of like you were kind of like he's trying but it's like no he doesn't have adhd it's like dude like just let him be and like if he wants to blend in with people 
let him try at least. <laughs> yeah, but in public speaking, it was just like that. Like I was the same. I was. It's funny how we have a very similar story. Like whenever, yeah. whenever public speaking would come around, like everyone's everyone's heads be like, "Oh no, it's speech season." I'm yeah. like, "Let's go!" Yeah, yeah. Like, I was just so pumped, and I was like, "Yes, like I love speaking in speech season." But I'm gonna tell you something. So, in the last day, literally yesterday or the day before. Uh, it was yesterday. I was actually finally diagnosed with ADHD. Oh, okay. So it took me 30, 30 years to finally get it. And like, literally, like I've had it my whole life. I, everyone's told me that. But my parents, I love them to death. They're very supportive. They never got me tested. And I would always have like really bad anxiety, depression. Like I hit, I hit from about 20, about 22 to twenty. Yeah, 22 is when it like started like 24 is when it was the worst. That's when it was yeah. got absolute some of the worst, darkest times of my life. And I I I was just this kid that was trying to be funny and trying to do his do his thing. And like I just could not get over the demons in my head. It was just very negative thoughts. And I remember I just like I was I was, you know, I was back drinking a lot and I was doing drugs and and I was always this kid. And I said in the beginning, I was this kid with potential. And like I was always a kid that like, man, like you're going to do something one day in your life. Like you're going to do And like, here I am like smoking every day and drinking and doing drugs and staying up all night and being a party animal. And just like, I couldn't, I couldn't get away from it. And I, I remember going to the doctor when I was 24 and I was like, help. Like there's like their voices in my head and I just can't, I can't. And he, and he got me a, a psychiatrist and I went through that. And again, they didn't diagnose me. They said, Greg, some days you walk in here with the, ex- a crazy anxiety disorder and other days yeah. you're just a creative outgoing guy that just loves to be the life of the party. So for years, it was just like, never knew what it was. And, and I, I've through COVID and stuff like that, I had some dark spells and um, you know, last, like just before I took a month off social media because it just hit, like, this is my first day back. Actually. It's kind of funny how this is the first interview where like, this is my first time back really on social media in about a month. And then I just need to take a break from it. And um, let's, let's be honest, Greg, you've seen one of my, you see my, when we were discussing earlier, you got the voice message from me and you're like, all right, that is enough. I am now taking a break. That was, <laughs> that was the turning point where it's like some guy in Newfoundland wants me to be a part of a podcast. That is when I'm like, shut it down. Yeah. Let him go yeah, away. You, you got me. I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to yeah. say it, but yeah. Oh, I, I could, I could see it. I could totally see it now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, man, it was just, I just hit this thing and I, and I finally was just like, man, I just got to get this, I got to do some tests and I got to figure it out because, you know, I just want to figure it out. And, and um, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a pretty awesome breakthroughs and I feel like I'm becoming more of a, a just a stronger a person because of it. And it's all going to lead back to my story. And if I can now eventually, you know, put this into my show and I can put comedy and improv and, you know, make people laugh, but I can also make people like actually think and say like, Hey, you know what? I'm not perfect. I have my demons and I have my stuff that I work through. And I hope that people can get inspired to this, you know, even though like I have my bouts with it, I'm still putting on a smile and I still try and battle through it. And I think that's, that's who I want to be known as, as an artist, is that someone that can take you through so many different emotions uh, during a show. Well, yeah, like I, I give you full credit because I mean, not a lot of people, whether they're going through like depression, anxiety, whatever, like get it tested or even like in your case with the ADHD, like really ever discover it. And then sometimes it's like too late and then you yeah. portray them as like a monster when it's like, dude, like he's not a monster as much as it is like they just didn't know. Like I know. So I'm not let's put it this way. I'm not afraid to ever get canceled by saying what I say on these things. But like I look at back of it when I was younger and it was like the Aurora shooting for like uh, what they call it the Batman shooting. Yeah. And people blame that guy like he's a, and like, yeah, I get it. Like there's a lot of people that died in that. But I'm like, if you look at the backstory, he was just a normal kid. He mm-hmm. was pretty normal. I think they even said that two or three days before this ha- happened, he had went to the university and submitted like a document that wanted to see a therapist or the school psychiatrist saying like, I am not well. And I'm like, number one, the kind of you let him down because he's basically telling you I need help. And yeah. then like the idea of with the States anyway, where it's like anyone can kind of own a gun doesn't help either. But it's like, yeah. you know, he did at least try his best to be like, hey, I'm not OK here. Help. And it's like he just reached a point where it's like, I don't think anyone's helping me. I I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, I, I like 
again, people will be like, he still killed people and stuff. I'm like, I get it. But there is yeah. the, also the human side of we didn't really do much for him either. It's like there's yeah. only so much you can do. But at the same point is something is better than nothing. And yeah. I like that. The fact that you went down the road of, you know, going to therapy when you said, OK, this is not working for me. This is similar to like what Carrie Price did. Like yeah. years later, we could have looked at Carrie Price's story completely different and be like, oh, my God, like this guy didn't have help. And then yeah. one day he just went off the road or he committed suicide or whatever. And then you're like, fuck, like someone should have been there. But he took it upon himself to be like, but boss, I'm not OK. Like, yeah. And then I'm like, full credit to him. I don't care if anyone says he's like his. Oh, well, he's he's not the best goalie anymore. I'm like, OK, but he's still a good, yeah. decent person. He knew this was coming. But um, yeah. like, I'm 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like for me. I'm not diagnosed with any, like I, I have Sturge Weber syndrome, which is like seizure strokes. I had one mm. when I was like 12, but I'm not diagnosed with depression or anything. Cause my joke that I tell, that's pretty dark. I, I guess some people might find it funny, but like, I'm like, I could go see a therapist, a psychiatrist, and I bring people together. So two of them would like end up like discussing me the whole time. They're like, thank you, Brian. We're actually getting married. And I'm like, what about me? <laughs> well, we can't help you. I'm like, but you brought us together. So there's one for you. I'd be like, great. That's my yeah. thing. I bring people together. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, man. And I think I, I think with with everything, like, you know, obviously when when the Aurora happened and, and and everything, like it was just so much harder to like understand when you said you wanted to help. It's just like it wasn't just it, it's so much easier now in today's generation to just say that. And like, yeah. you know, that's the problem though, is 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 almost becoming like anxiety is be and, and this whole mental health thing has become almost like you know, it's become a trigger word. It's becoming such like a, an everyday word that like sometimes it, it, it doesn't have much weight. It doesn't have enough weight when you say, hey, I got anxiety and depression. It's like, great, man. Like, I, I feel like everyone has it nowadays. Yeah. And like, and I shied away from that ever speaking about my problems because I just felt like I was just one in a mil. I was one in a million. Oh, yeah. great. He's got anxiety. He's got depression. Welcome to the club. And, and, and I think for me, it's just like, you know, I knew there was more to it. I knew there was, there was things going on in my head. And I, I knew that it just wasn't just normal thoughts or just what people would say, like, man, you're fine. It's just, you're having a bad day. And it's just like, you, you're like, yeah, maybe I am. <laughs> maybe I yeah. am having a bad day. Yeah. I didn't sleep much last night. You know, that's yeah. probably it. Yeah. And then next week it happens again. You're like, you know what? It's probably sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And you just I've keep had, doing that. You keep yeah. doing that. And it's like, no, stop. Yeah. There's I've, something going on. Yeah. I've had those where it's like, so kind of going off like the sports journalism side of things where like I was looking for work. I couldn't find work in the field. And I'm like, I know I'm good. Like, I know I can do this. Cause again, I grew up with Jay and Dan too. And realizing that they could like make fun of Sergey Bobrovsky. And yeah. I'm like, wow, you guys are like assholes sometimes on the air, but <laughs> you're funny and you're getting paid for this. I'm like, that yeah. is completely new to me. But yeah. I remember sitting there, I'm like, I'm good. Why am I getting not jobs? And like, I was looking at my bank account getting drained because school yeah. and I'll, and then I was just like, one night I was at my brother's and they went and got a pizza and I really wanted a pizza. And I was looking at my bank, I got afford a pizza, but it was just like one of those moments where I'll make fun of it. Some people like, Hey, don't make fun of that. But like, I looked at them like, all right, like I got like, like a hundred and something bucks in my account. I'm like, I could probably get a pizza, but can I afford the pineapples? Can yeah. I afford them? And then like someone's like, and then I'd phone home, be like, I can't afford pineapples on pizza. And mom is just like, get it together, please. And I'm just like, you don't understand. And it's like, I don't even think it's about the pineapples on pizza as much as it was 20 job applications, 20 yeah. rejects. But like, it's just yeah. like, you find something that like, just that's the straw. That's yeah. the bro. Like you could have been like the whole week where it's like, no rejection, no big deal. Soccer night. Awesome. Uh, another rejection, no big deal. Ball hockey night. And then it's like Sunday night. It's like, no rejections, no nothing. You're like, I can't even afford a goddamn pizza. So I get it. And like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not teasing people because we've got people that I play ball hockey and soccer with where you, you know, something's a little bit different about them just yeah. because they're going through something. So you're like, listen, the most you can do is say to someone, Hey, listen, I'm not accusing you of having depression or whatever, but like, if there's something you ever want to talk about, I'm open. Like, just let me know. Yeah. And if, if they're happy about that, then great. Like, I, I don't feel like forcing some like, no, absolutely. There's something like you are depressed. You talk about that to me. It's like, just let them know you're there. That's all. That's yeah. it. Like sometimes that's all the help that they need. 
and just, and, and, you know, and share, and share your story and share your, what you like, you yeah. know, if you're having thoughts, I think one thing about that is like, that's kind of like the, you know, a lot of people do say that they say, man, I'm always here for you. Anytime you want to talk, but it's just like, do you, it's like, it's more of like the Greg, how are you today? Yeah. Really want to know? Yeah. And then they're just kind of like, actually, uh, honestly, I shouldn't I'm, open I'm, the box. I shouldn't I'm open not, the box. I'm not, I'm not doing good, man. I'm not doing yeah. good. It's like, man, you could have just said good you. You could have like, yeah, 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 yeah. you could have just ended it there, but it's just like you know you don't want to feel like you're burdening people, and if you all of a sudden you jump and that's and like you know one of my biggest things is like is like I believe this like wholeheartedly that like like therapy is literally a cheat code for life. Like I'm telling you because like I believe in it because you talk to friends and you know sometimes they can't relate and they sit there and listen and it's sometimes really great is all you need. But if you go to someone, you can literally unleash and unload on every goddamn thing you had in your head, and no yeah. one's going to judge you. And then they they take it all in. They go, "All right, yeah, feel better." I'm like, "I do." And yeah. they're like, "Okay, now let's work on that." And this it's, is what we can do and build that. And here's a solution. And I'm just like, ah, I friends like, can't give you a solution. Yeah, therapy is like that. I find some people can just go in, talk about it. And they're just like listening to you. Where a friend would, but I feel like you read their facial expressions. Like I had a friend when I was in university and I would complain about like the other girls next door, but she was roommates with him, which was like probably the worst case to do. But yeah, uh, I would say like, oh, well, this person's really not listening to me. And our face went from like, and I'm just like, okay, I know that you do not agree with what I just said. But then yeah. she's like, no, no, I, I'm <clears> listening. I'm like, no, you are making the judgment now of like, wow, I can't yeah. believe he said that about my roommate and yeah. you're just like yeah fair <laughs> yeah i know we talked a little bit about the music side we talked a lot about uh other aspects which is i enjoyed hopefully you did as well yeah uh but i i did want to mention a little bit of i guess in terms of when you mentioned about going into sports broadcast just because i like sports as well but like what really when you were doing i guess the internship in toronto like you mentioned about them getting you to do like a lot of the media stuff a lot of like did you take any of that in process when you're doing like the music side? Cause I know sometimes you take something from another field and apply it to what you're doing now. Like I know I only did like a one week internship at global in Toronto, mm. but I took some of the aspects that they gave me to do this podcast. Cause similar to what I think you said in interviews where it's like, they were just kind of making you the gopher. Like I could make a mean coffee. That was like the same for me. People would come to town. I'm like, I could do this interview. I could do this interview to like, you go in the back. Yeah. I'm like, man, I'm never getting the chance here. So then yeah. I took it to the podcast world where I'm like, <clears throat> here's where I can show them this is what you could have given me. But yeah. was that kind of like your realm into like the music side where it's like, hey, I could do this in this field? Exactly. It was just be my own boss, right? It was just the, yeah. the opportunity just to make my own rules. And um, honestly, yeah, like TV broadcasting in that world, like it, it's helped me so much. And like a lot of people – you know, like we'll, we'll notice, like even when I'm doing interviews or stuff like that, they're like, have you done this before? Like, have you done a lot of like media training? And I'm like, I went to school and I was, I was doing the interviewing. So it's like, yeah. I almost know like what to look for and like, you know, how to answer questions and like, you know, shut up when you have to and keep talking when you have to. And it's just like, it's become very natural to me. And like, I think that's helped me a lot is when I do interviews, they're like, man, that was a, really fun interview and i was like thanks like i i loved it i had a great time and i think if you just are a musician that just concentrates on the lyrics and the songwriting and you don't ever have media training you put them in front of a camera and they're like yeah good yeah good day and it's just <laughs> like i i just had i just felt like i was building a foundation of like being comfortable on camera and being comfortable on radio and and all these different things that allowed me to you know, just know kind of had an idea of what I was doing when, when these opportunities uh, uh, came to me. It's like the meme that I see a lot on social media now where it's like, good soup. <laughs> like, good, good soup. Good, yeah, yeah, good. Big good soup. Save, yeah, big yeah, yeah. The, I, I, the other thing that I want to ask, just kind of to clue it up a little bit of the fun aspect of the side of things here. Um, if you don't mind having a fun game, if we just call it like basically random. So I'll like toss yeah. out random questions. This is like a killer part for me because I like to present myself as someone who knows a lot of things. And then yeah. I'll ask a random question. It's like, never heard of that. What the hell? And I'll be like, all right, edit that out. But then at the same yeah. point, I'm like, nah, keep it in. Um, so I'm going to ask you like when you grew up listening to music, cause I know 
but oh, that's a great way to word it when you were listening to music. Like, no, I was a child that never listened to music. Um, but I understood from reading it that there was like a Tim McGraw song that you really liked, which was like, uh, don't take the girl and a rascal flats one of, I think it's like Sarah Beth. My I love, song. I love two of those like artist bands. Yeah. My favorite one of Tim McGraw was, um, live they're, like you're dying. What? Yeah. Yeah. I like that one. I liked that one from Tim McGraw. Cause of, of course that was about his, his dad, but it's like, Oh, she's my kind of rain. That's the one that I always yeah. listen to in university. And I imagined yourself with a girl in the rain. Yeah. And now when I get older, I'm like, yeah, let's both catch pneumonia. That's, <laughs> that's so attractive. But uh, like, were there other like bands or artists that you like really kind of idolized or adored? Cause I was a great Backstreet Boys fan. I say that yeah. now knowing that it's okay to say that now. Yeah. When I was in high school, it was like, look at this dweeb over here listening to the Backstreet Boys. I'm like, shut up. Yeah. It was funny. Like, uh, yeah, I didn't listen to much country music until like it was, it was uh, every single time I drove to a hockey game with, uh, my 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 best friend's family like they would always put on country and it was like this this guy in a cowboy hat i was like i'm not listening to this like i look at the album and i'm like this is not what i want to listen to like i was into alexis on fire and disturbed and nice. god smack and like you know that kind of music like i, I was huge like my favorite band growing up was the used and okay. my chemical romance my first concert was the used and my chemical romance and I was a huge like emo punk guy and I love good Charlotte. And, you know, I just love all that kind of angsty music. And, uh, I remember, yeah, like I started getting a little older and I started listening to the Sarah best song. And I remember there was a the first song, Tim McGraw came out, don't take the girl. And then they would put on like the rascal flat CD and Sarah Beth would come on and I'd just be staring at the window. I'm like, this is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> this is goddamn beautiful. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, it's a story. It's a freaking story. It's not like loud music, like blah, 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 blah. Like, like, and then Panic of the Disco was another one of my favorites. And uh, I just remember country music came, kind of came in and it was just like, man, they're literally t t telling a story. And, um, you know, those songs really jumped out on me. And that's when I started to, you know, kind of explore more of the country world and, um, yeah, really start falling in love with the lyrics and the storytelling. I think that's what always jumped out to me. My music library goes from like, cause I like some of those acts that you mentioned I have on my um, iPhone, but like, I remember growing up loving like Christmas music. Cause we're almost in that season here, but like, I love the Christmas classics, mm -hmm. but all like people used to accuse me of being like very dramatic because it's like, I listen to fallout boys. You'll shoot your eye out. And it's like one of the opening lyrics is like, don't come home for Christmas. And my <laughs> friends are like, do you not want to see your brothers? I'm like, no, that's fine. I'm like, I just like the song is different. I'm like, if you want, I can put on Mariah Carey for like the thousandth time. If that makes you think that I'm cheerful, but yeah, I just like just alternate music. And I remember like I would go from similar to you, like going on a hockey trip or wherever. Uh, and I'd go from say Garth Brooks. I'm, yeah. I'm like random on your iPod or whatever. At this point, it was like Garth Brooks, Fall Out Boy, Avril Lavigne, uh, Simple Plan. And then next minute we go right back to Shania Twain and the person like that, we were sharing your ear, like whatever thing. We'd be like, can you just pick a goddamn <laughs> genre that we can listen to the whole? I'm like, why? I'm like, it's like, well, well cause we just went from sugar. You're going down to welcome to my life. To yeah. Now I got to listen to come on over by Shania. Twain. I'm like, and it's a variety. And they're like, they're like, I'm going to share my ear phone with Dave. I'm like, Dave who left me at the goddamn party and I had to go in the kitchen. <laughs> Like, like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Greg, to, to kind of clue it all up there, the last random question I want to ask you is, because uh, Christmas is upon us, mm -hmm. uh, what, are you more of like an eggnog guy or is it something else that you kind of dive into? Because I know people are like cider or eggnog. They either has a real tree or, Christ or a fake tree. Or some mm. people like love Christmas music or Christmas music and movies are like, just show me ones that you know yeah i can watch at christmas okay what, so like and, and all those three what are you yeah so i'll go fake tree fake, no okay i love real tree but i just like we always had this like we did it a couple years in the family and it was just the pines were everywhere uh and then we just started to get those really realistic fake trees and they're just so much easier so yes i i think that is nice uh christmas movies and christmas movies, i love only when it's very close to Christmas. Like I'm talking that very short window where yeah. it's like Christmas morning, like Christmas Eve, maybe a couple days before I'll watch some movies. But 
I, I can't get into the spirit like in November. I'm sorry. Like that's just not me. That's not my style. I don't, ne- don't look I, over here. There's no Christmas lights over here. Don't worry about that. <laughs> it's not my, I, I don't think I'll ever do a Christmas song. Like, I don't think that's ever going to be my brand or my style. It's just well, like, Oh, give I it love. up, Greg. Next year, you'll, <laughs> next year you'll be on this podcast and you'll be like, Brian, I had an epiphany and I'm going to release a Christmas song this year. I'd be like, yeah, I, I know I was on it. It's going to be a funny Christmas song. Yeah, it's going to be and, like, you and Parker. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be like, yeah, it's going to be something funny about like, just be, like, that's the only way I'll do a comedy Christmas song, yeah. but I'll never do a serious, like, and I'll be home for Christmas. I, just, I think like, you do a good job either way, but I, I mean, you would do something where it's like Santa got run or grandma got run over by a reindeer, but you'd be like, <laughs> you would change it up to something else where it's like, you know, yeah. like uh grandma got run over by like a, a snow plow or a Zamboni. Yeah. And I'd be like, damn, this is hockey related and Christmas. This is a double win. Yeah. You know what? I actually just singing that song actually made me a little bit kind of like, cause I I'm, I'm far away from my family right now across the country. Do so it. it's like, I'll be home for Christmas could, could honestly be like the only one serious song that I could actually see myself singing. I would like, like, you know what? I'm putting it out there right now, Greg, you yeah. team up with Parker, do that duet, release it before Christmas and watch people be like, wow, they did a really killer job at this. And I'd be like, yes, but where's my goddamn credit? <laughs> I'm I'm gonna call her right after this and be like, uh, Tobin yeah. said that we should do an "I'll Be Home for Christmas" uh, Parker and uh, Greg yeah. edition. I'm like, and, and, it's and, and she'll be like, she'll be like that same motherfucker who sent me a goddamn CD sleeve. I'd be yeah. like, he'd be like, he was he was bitching about it for an hour with me on the phone, and then he has the nerve to send me one of his own, and I'd be like, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> that's gonna do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Greg Ryder for coming on to the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thank you for listening, and good night.